Can you see the recording button on the top? Uh, no. Okay. All right. So here we're going to start. Hey, guys. Uh, welcome to Bully Finance. Uh, you know, we're still learning on this end, uh, but we may not be pretty, but it, it's going to work for us. And uh, so Manny is here. Pete is here. I'm Pete. That's Manny. And, uh, you know, we, we got some nice designs. We redid our slide deck a little bit. Um, but here's what we're going to do, okay? As we stated, and thanks for joining us from your, you know, seeing us on YouTube and then coming in and checking us out. You know, we had uh, a deck and I presented a lesson about, like, concepts in this slide. And then the second part of this is to honestly have a discussion with another professional about what it is that I wrote so we can get more perspective rather than just you listening to me because I'm slanted and you know we're here with Manny to have balance. And then what we want to do is starting off in May, we want to invite you to like a round table so that you can ask us questions on the same thing. So by the time we go through this, you know, hopefully you're going to have that perspective that we think that you need in order to do better on your interviews to get that first promotion or just even understand corporate finance a little bit more. So going on to this slide, the second slide is a very basic outline of what we're going to cover. And, you know, these are, you know, anytime you have a textbook, the first chapter is a, a introduction of a lot of different things. And you're saying to yourself after you're done with chapter one, what the hell am I going to learn? But in all honesty, it's a hodgepodge. And this is what we see in corporate finance. Many of the the topics are somewhat different, but it, it does set a frame for where we're going to go. So we're going to talk about, you know, why the firm is in existence, what's the goals. We're going to talk about corporate governance, which is near and dear to Manny, my heart. Uh, talk about risk, another topic that's near and dear to our heart. Accounting, that's near to Manny's heart. Pete's not, eh, Pete's not in love with it, but he's a user. And then valuation, I think that we're uh, on top of everything. Okay, so that that's that's attractive to both of us. So Manny, I'm going to ask you. Okay, so you know here we see the corporate goals, and you know we're thinking to ourselves, hey, look, it, 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 do you believe it's still all about profit for the firm? It, are we are we to anything else besides trying to make money for the shareholders? I would say yes, Pete. I mean, without the profit motive. There's no real incentive for the corporation to invest it, right? Um, you, you know, even if you take other long-term ventures, the green ventures and any other ventures that people are taking, or what you would call non-profit ventures, they still have some good coming out of it at the end. In corporate finance, you know, we, most of the time, we focus in on the financial gains, but there are other entities that do, you know, when you invest in education for your kids, you're spending money, but you're expecting some kind of future benefit out of that, right? It's not tangible today, but um, when you reduce carbon emissions, it's a future benefit that you're getting. So that all these ventures have all human endeavors have some kind of future benefit. Otherwise, the guy, we will just be sitting around doing nothing. So that's you know, fine. Manny. I mean, like, and for the people watching this, like, I'm old, I think, and I just learned something from Manny—a new way to look at the world in terms of you know when we value a firm. A lot of time, you know, we're saying profit. Profit is revenue minus expense, right? Basically, and at the end of the day, Manny just gave me a great idea in terms of. You know, what is the societal value of what the firm is doing? So, for instance, uh, at the end of the day, I can measure dollars. A firm that's profitable makes positive cash flow at the end of the day, right? But what you're saying is, is that, you know, listen, value doesn't necessarily have to be in monetary terms. Value could be clean air. Value could be, you know, better education, better opportunity set reduce racism, whatever it happens to be. And that's a real good point. The question is, do you believe the market then rewards the firm for doing this by, as we know, as an investor, you invest for capital gain, which is dividend plus the share of your stock going up. Do you 
and I don't really have a feel for this because social and green investing is kind of two or three years old now, right? And it's really not picked up. But do you believe the market actually places value on this stuff? So uh, I believe you cover this elsewhere, Pete, under risk, right? So the market would somehow, the, you know, the I think that when you go to risk, you will probably will cover the risk bands where the risk free rate, uh, rate for my money right now, I can, you, you know, put it in a 10 year treasury and got, get 175 return on it, right? 175 basis points return on there in somewhat. Yeah. But then I could also take the same money uh, and put it in a real estate investment. I think you also touch upon that in your present value calculation where I could rent it out for 10 years at the end of 10 year, 10th year, I'm gonna have a some kind of expected value of the property that I'm gonna sell and get out, right? But, you know, as an investor with the money, I have all these choices. I could, you know, or I could even go to another riskier venture which will give me a much better return on the real estate investment. I might get like a ten percent return, or you know, I'm just saying that for now. But I could put a seed money into a Netflix when it starts, or Amazon when it starts, and you know, it's, it's again risk return. I could lose all my money, or I could make thousand percent. So, and especially. What, one of the things that you'll find is there is a group of investors who want their long-term steady investment and they will pay those companies, they'll pay to be part of the investment pool or the equity investor in a company that provides steady returns and they'll drive the price of that. You know, but the, the yeah, market, you know, um, no, I, I agree with you because like, again, I mean, like I've done a lot of economics, Manny, and the economics is a weird kind of discipline because at the core of economics is decisions made by humans. Yep, and yep. like you said, like there's different investor cohorts out there. And when we look at someone who's 50 years old, maybe this person doesn't want to be inve investing in cryptocurrency to try to hit a home run. Maybe this person wants something like I'll invest in a utility company. I'll get a solid dividend and a dollar per share or a 2% uh, rise. Okay, but l let's go back and you know before we we take take a look here. I'm I'm back to the profit. Now, if if okay, the firm has to create value. And so I think that we've agreed that value implies a combination maybe of money and actually social value, right? Yep. And so the market will then as we kind of believe now, we'll begin to value that social and green investing. And we do believe that this is going to happen because this is a long-term investment, right? So with carbon emissions, for instance, okay, the bottom line is, is that people can't feel today, okay, hey, look, I'm investing in something green. But 10 years from now, maybe they'll measure the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it'll be a little bit better, right? And we can say, you know, that was an investment. And now these firms that added to that, they should be up in value. But a question that I have too, and I think is a useful question to the students watching is, so we're, we're looking at a corporation, right? And one of the things I'm very interested in, and this gets into a little bit with asset liability management, which is part of this slide presentation, is how do you, how do you Manny, look at the components? What is, what adds up to be the firm how do you evaluate it on its own standalone profit, right? Ability to make profit. So for instance, Manny, me and you know that a corporation might be, uh, I guess, broken apart or characterized by its legal entities, and it might be characterized by its line of business. But I get down and I'd like to challenge you and say that if I'm looking at a line of business inside a firm, like PepsiCo, a line of business is soft drinks, right? Mm -hmm. And if I'm looking at soft drinks, I have to look at Pepsi and Diet Pepsi and Mountain Dew and Mountain Dew and 
and Gatorade and whatever else is in their portfolio of drinks. And I have to look at that down to its lowest level of contributing to the bottom line. Now, do you think that's true or you, what, what's your thoughts on that? No, I mean, they, they do have to analyze each one of the relationships, right? And find out if the transaction is making money for them on a whole. Um, because without your first statement, the, the profit motive, there, you know, there is no reason for a corporation to engage in these endeavors that cost them time, money, humans, everything else. And at the end of the day, for the investor to wind up with less money than when he started out. Yeah, unless, exactly. Unless so I think, he, I think, and we're going to go to the next slide, Manny, the bell's ding in here. Me and Manny have this like super secret timing going on here. We don't really, but we're trying to, we're trying to do we, something. We, but, you know, here's the scoop. The, the deal is, is that, you know, when, when you know, I'm thinking about an opportunity for students, right? How, how can you take this little discussion and do anything with it? Is so, that, so. to be honest with you, you have to be cognizant of what creates value. You can go into marketing and try to bring attention to those things that you believe adds value, right? There's job opportunities for that. But you could also be an analyst inside the firm. And what me and Manny know for sure is that every single item on a general ledger has to be evaluated for its profitability. And because we're so competitive now, it comes down to a basis point, maybe. And for those that don't know what a basis point is, what's that, Manny? What's a basis point? What's one BIP? One hundredth of one percent. One hundredth of one percent. So we're down. And we even go farther out than one hundredth of one percent, but we're we're this is the margins that we're looking at, right? In the financial world, but even if you're looking at like box grocery stores, you know their margin on a product is very narrow, right? So we 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 need to make sure that everything adds up to be its value added, right? And that that is so important. And there's a lot of analysis that goes into that, and there's a lot of behavioral kind of things that go into it because as we're going to show you as we wrap up this presentation tonight that expectations plays a great role in everything we do okay so now i'm on to the next slide and you know i'm thinking here that you know manny we we've, we've i don't expect us to put a lot of time in talking about the different forms of business ownership but we know that business basically starts with me and Manny thinking about this business that we're doing right now. A lot of stuff starts off with individual entrepreneurs just thinking about an idea and then seeing what, what's going to happen. And then you might uh, build a partnership by that. And then we might be so good that a corporation decides to buy us out for millions of dollars. And, you know, we'll be set for life. But to be honest with you, we have to know that there's a lot of failure. There's a lot of risk of being a sole proprietorship. Matter of fact, Manny, I was at my dentist Monday night. We can use him for an example, all period. And he said, you know, Pete, he says, we never learned business in dental school. Because I was asking him how he went through COVID-19, right? And guys, this video is April 2021. And it's still, I mean, it's apropos because he wasn't thinking about business. He knows how to fill cavities and shine teeth and do all that other stuff. But I'm asking him last night or this week about how he's going to invest in his dental office. And it, it's like, he didn't, he was saying, well, I'm looking for how many years it's going to take to pay back. And that's like, Ooh, that's a, uh, yeah, that's one way we can evaluate something. But to be very honest with you, that's the most elementary way. So, you know, he's not yet thinking, but so you have pros and cons of each type of ownership. But the one thing that I'll get into the middle and I'll just ask Manny because people heard me on the video is that actually, you know, because shareholders are the owners of the firm and through this principal agent relationship, they, they hire senior managers to run the firm, right. And to utilize their money to make them more money or create more value. There's, mm -hmm. there's sometimes there's a breaking point. And I think Enron was a great story, but I'm going to throw this out to Manny and say, Manny, you got any, like in, in your history, and don't get into any banks that we might know about, but anything at all that tickles your funny bone about uh, corporate governance or anything like that. In, in, in what sense, Pete? In, 
corporate governance in terms of ownerships and ownership. Well, no, the breaking, the breaking of that principal agent oh, relationship and the need for that corporate governance in place. Yeah, I mean, we see this constantly, right? There might be, there is incentive for the managers to seek short-term gains so they could get paid today, right? And they might be creating some long-term problems. So, you know, there, were, there was, a, you know, they, like I'll give you an example. Um, there was a large firm, it's still out there. They used to have an insurance uh, business. And those, ins there were long-term insurance contracts, but the premiums were upfronted in the early years through some kind of accounting gimmick, you want to call it some kind of aggressive modeling where they showed a lot of profit in the first early years. But when the losses in these long-term contracts would come in the back end, they've already you know, wasted most of the premium on it. So, they, so the, the, the managers who were in the first three, four years got paid handsomely. Uh, yes. And then with this kind of things where the managers would hide is, it, in the early years, it's very hard to pick up that you are doing this because you're growing your premium base. So you go 100 million, 300 million, 400 million, 500 million. You're adding new product in all the time. And so nobody is paying attention to that. You know, as long as you're growing, your PNL would work. When you do this, and when you stop that, you know the the substitute guys had to suffer through a couple of years of losses, big losses, and they didn't get paid. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, like to be honest with you, like you know, uh, uh, like it's it's tough for us to sit here and talk about examples in the financial industry because a lot of these companies are still around and. You know, whether they're thriving or just surviving, no one knows. But it's it's tough for us to come out with an example. But I, I mean, I, since... it's another example that I can give you from the banking industry. Banking industry years ago used to take loan origination fees and book them right two percent loan origination fees, book them straight into income. Right. But the loan may stay on your books for ten years, and the loan may not be a good loan after three years. So there was, there was, you know, um, there was problems because the based on the income, the managers would get paid up front, and it, yeah, it, this created a lot. This loan right. really created a lot of SNLs problems during the eighties. Yeah, hey, hey Manny, uh, my hometown's Pittsburgh, right? And people from Pittsburgh. We really don't talk English well at all. We don't, I mean, it, 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 we have our own language in Pittsburgh for the most part, okay? Now I live in New York, but it's a different story. My question is, is um, and you bring up a great opportunity set for the students to think about, is that as a result of Sarbanes-Oxley Act and, the, and these in, enhanced corporate governance, there's whole disciplines on studying senior managers, and I'm going to try to say the word, is it remuneration? A remuneration. Remuneration. Yeah, no one else to say that word. Okay, so yeah, it's spelled out right here on a thing. So remuneration is the compensation package associated with managers or maybe a lower level down from that, right? Yep. So if you're thinking about this and you're thinking about what what drives the intention of the manager, and this really is, I think, a key here. A key is, is that as people who invest for a firm, work for a firm, own a firm, I have to find out what the investment, the, the in incentive of the manager is. So, like, for instance, my first job out of college, I was sold, I, I was paid a commission, right? And the reason why they had me on a commission, it's a base plus a commission, is that I was to sell copiers and fax machines door to door and make a lot of money, right? And that was supposed to incentivize me to get out there and pound the pavement, right? So you look at how managers at investment banks get paid now, 
and some of them get a flat salary plus a bonus pool. Okay. And when we look at that, we look to see, well, the bonus pool is going to be paid if the performance of the firm is good, right? Now, how, how does this work, right? So management who are thinking about, well, you know, I'm going to leave this firm in two years, they may pump the firm up if they have that ability, or in, if maybe their bonus is a function of what comes out of their line of business, right? Where is that measurement that they're being uh, performative? So Manny and I both know that a lot of times we'll be talking to senior managers of firms, and I'll just say, so how, how are you judged? What is your goals and objectives? How are you measured for your performance? Because that allows me then to understand if something's going on in this firm, I know it's either hand in glove with the the, the um, incentives of the manager or it's just by luck, right? And, mm -hmm. and this is a very important thing. But I think that, you know, for those people out there and you're thinking about, well, what can I do with this little nugget of information is that there's a lot of opportunities to get in to analyst and audit and risk management. And it's about thinking about how do these people get paid? How do the staff get paid? Because this is remuneration and this is a huge topic now in terms of corporate governance, understanding how the people get paid, right? And, and so this, yeah, go ahead, Manny. And only thing on this one, you know, you, you, you talked about the agent principal relationship and how they maintain it. The investor maintains it through a series of limits and risk control framework, right? They'll have internal audit, other people, or second lines of defense looking at the le level of uh, uh, risk taken by the bank. Yeah, all right, all right, Manny. So I'm gonna have to stop you right there. This is where me and Manny, if I was, over, if I was in his house, me and him, well, he beat me up because uh, he's much stronger than me. But I would say, okay, so Manny, you made, you made, you, 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 you dove off into acronyms and stuff like that, right? So really quickly for the students out there that are thinking about this, this corporate governance framework, right? Yeah. How do you help us? Tell us yes. what the three lines of defense is before you start lumping into the second line and all this yeah. other stuff right I mean, the back. It, the lines of defense are pretty much there for the benefit of the investor because they have the principal agent relationship. They have to rely on the agent to manage the money. They make sure that the agent is, you know, adhering to what the investor's wants and needs and goals and objectives by creating three lines of defense. First line would be at the level of transaction. And the second line is the guys, they have to make sure that they're looking over the first line is doing, which would be usually a risk management function. And then you have an audit group, which is the third line of defense. They'll come in and make sure the second line is doing their work properly. Even with all these controls, things do go bad. <laughs> Oh, I mean, you're, you're, uh, Manny, I think that you did a, a real good job. And again, I'm, me and Manny's a team and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of try to improve each other when we say something, but yeah, you're, you're right. Okay. So the, the three, okay. So you have this relationship here. I am a shareholder. Okay. Uh, basically the relationship goes that through this agent process. Okay. I've hired senior managers to, to run the firm for me and create value. Now, the bottom line is I'm not looking over the manager's shoulder on a daily basis. I don't know what the managers are doing. I don't know what the firm even does. I'm just an owner of a share of stock. So in between the owner of the share of stock and the senior managers is board of directors, right? And board of directors is like a liaison that kind of is supposed to be knowledgeable enough about the firm and have firm players on it that they can allow then the shareholders to have a, a representative view as to what management's doing. Okay, so that's basically it. Now, inside the firm, then you have these three lines of defense, which, you know, tries now, and today this is so important, because one of the topics that we're going to get here at the bottom, if you look at the red in the bottom of this slide, invest only if expected returns are greater than cost. Manny and I clearly know that any 
any investment that we do has to be evaluated on its risk and return, right? So if I told you, hey, class, I can earn 10%, and you didn't ask me, well, what is the risk of that project? Then that's that's up to you, right? I could be gambling at Atlantic City or Las Vegas, and then you'd say, "Well, I don't, I don't think that's <laughs> going to earn me ten percent." You could put it all on black. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And actually, Manny, I think that I I actually wrote or authored a little thing on YouTube with exactly the same philosophy as what you said. So these three lines of defense means, hey, look, if there's risk created in the firm, risk is okay. As long as people understand what it's about, right? We're not here to run firms. We're not here to say you're taking too little risk or too much risk. It's the not understanding of the risk. So then you have the risk taker. The risk taker honestly should understand the risk. Manny plays with, uh, you know, he's a gun collector and he goes out and he he's packing black powder and his gun in his backyard and the thing goes off and blows off a couple of fingers. And he says, Ooh, I didn't know that was going to happen. That's a problem. That's the first line of defense, not being active. Now, Manny's wife, she actually dabbles in guns, and she's looking out the kitchen window at Manny in the backyard with his new gun, and she hollers out the window. Holler is a Pittsburgh word. She yells out the window, Manny, you better be careful, and that's good. Third line of defense is the neighborhood cops who are driving up and down the street and hear this stuff, and they shut it down, right? So at the end of the day, it's all about recognizing risk. And the the last point that I say, this is like, I don't know what the, I call this. It might be a corollary or something like that. Something even more than a fact is that you invest if and only if expected returns are greater than cost. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so there's a whole science of trying to figure out what these expected returns are going to be. There's whole disciplines in understanding procurement and what the cost is going to be. We already talked about the cost of employment. And I know when the firm does better, I have to pay the people facing the street more money, right? Which is okay, because it's a win-win situation. All right, so let's go forward, always forward. And that red principle applies across all three uh, structures, sole proprietorship, partnerships, and corporations. Yes, and, and that's very true. Now, this slide here, Manny, I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on this because we basically talked about a yeah, lot of this stuff. From this slide, be, you know, if, if you're taking a corporate finance uh, class, or if you're looking at this, Sabin's Oxley is, you know, in plain English, plain language, it's just accountability. Oh, that's beautiful. It's just accountability for whatever financial statements that you're putting out there. They want senior managers to be accountable for whatever numbers that they put out on for public consumption. Already. Yeah. I, I'm I'm like at a loss of words, Manny. That was so eloquently stated. I mean, that was amazing. Thank you, Manny. That yeah, great comment. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Manny just <laughs> okay. So you're absolutely right. But I'll look at this one bullet, and I don't know whether you can see my cursor floating around. So it's one, two, three, four, the fifth bullet where it talks about yeah. socks, Sarbanes, Oxley. And we're looking at this, and you're saying, hey. The basic premise of this rule said you got to strengthen your audit committee. We need to have strong audit because this is the risk. Hey, Manny, like uh, it's April 2021. Yeah. And we yeah. just came off a fairly serious incident in the financial sector called Archigos. Without any banks, the students should know that some banks got hit hard. Some banks got out easy. And a lot of the firms, it comes down to how they risk managed that position, how the oversight could have, you know, improved the response, right? So at the end of the day, and we'll go back to thinking about, I think that we can talk about AIG, although I'm not savvy in talking about AIG. But Manny, you're, you should be pretty good about AIG because one of our prior employers was its big time regulator, right? Yeah. So. AIG's failure when it was loading up on credit default swaps, right? Yeah. They were selling a lot of credit default swaps. I'm going to say, Manny, that I think that that desk was about 11 guys, either up in Connecticut or London, but yep. it was a very, very, very small desk that no one knew what they were doing. 
and they were kind of off on the side and they almost took down that firm. Is that about right? That's about right. Um, if you want me to go into it, what happened? Yeah, for America. 30 seconds. Yeah, go ahead. Because you, you, I know that you know this place. So 30 seconds. So this is where the corporate goals and the risk that you take diverge. Okay. What, what I mean by that is when they sold these credit to fault swaps, they were on AAA portion of the structured securities. And AAA traditionally had um, no losses, so very low losses. Very low losses. Into the BIPs, guys, about three BIPs, which is three one hundredths of one percent. And they were getting about six basis points for each one of these contracts. So whatever the notional amount was, they were getting six basis points because nobody ever expected these things to lose money, right? But the whole reason everybody was buying these credit default swap contracts were because the if the banks could show that if they had structured securities and if, if they if they bought credit default swaps against them, and that they got a better capital treatment for them, right? So for accounting purposes, they were considered less risky or you know, they probably got close to zero capital treatment. So AIG was selling these things, thinking this is never gonna happen. This wasn't for any type of credit risk. This, the whole structure was there to uh, give, give the buyers a benefit on capital treatment, right? So they you know, you, you know, you're trying to hedge, do accounting, but you, you know, you're, you're thinking you're taking, you know, you're writing credit risk instruments to manage some kind of accounting risk weighted assets gain. When these things blew up, it was the credit risk that blew up. And there's, you know, they found out that the losses way exceeded. They blew right through the, because they were all structured securities based on other CDOs, which were based on subprime. It's a whole class you could go on. But when these things started collapsing, they started collapsing all the way through. And on these securities, the losses started exceeding what the bank was collecting as premium. But the bank wasn't even selling them as true credit to false swaps. They were just doing the facilitating transactions. Yeah, okay, so, um, okay, you said a lot out there and I'm thinking about, well, we cover that level of detail later on in this particular course, I'm not sure, but when you check us out for investments, you know, we're going to be there talking about these particular structures, right? Yeah. But one of the things I would also say, Manny, and, and I want you to correct me because I'm kind of thinking, I look at the credit default swap in a different way, right? Yeah. And I think that AIG was still in this play, right? Yeah. And yeah. if I said to you, Manny, Manny, you buy fire insurance on your neighbor's house. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think about that? You buy fire insurance on your neighbor's house. <laughs> I have every incentive to light the place on fire. Yeah, I mean, the only thing you can think is that you're betting that your neighbor's house is gonna burn down, right? But, or flood yeah. or a tree's gonna hit it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing that happened with a lot of this insurance, normally what we know is if we buy auto insurance, health insurance, we know what the underlying is, our car, our health, our house, right? Yep. But a lot of these yep. CDSs were actually, you know, and I, I look at it because maybe maybe Manny and I, we split up our, our careers a little bit at this point in time, but I'm looking at them as they were credit default swaps against sovereign, which means country debt, like Greece, right? So yep. in yep. 06, 07, 08, we had what was called the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain, right? And of those pigs, Greece was by far the, that it had the highest credit risk. Well, if I buy insurance on something that I think is going to default, I'll collect on that insurance. Yep. Now, some firms like AIG were saying, we'll sell you that insurance because there's no way a sovereign can ever go bankrupt. They're never going to default on their debt, even though we know Venezuela and, you know, you just start listing all the countries that's defaulted, right? Yeah, yeah. But this is a story. We're going to collect a premium and we're never going to have to pay on this. This is a great gig until mm -hmm. it wasn't a good gig anymore. 
And this is where the United States government had to come in. And during 0708, I think we at that time gave them $85 billion, AIG, to kind of rescue them. And of all the firms that received money during that period of time, AIG got the most. Yeah, right. And so, and the, yeah, and on corporate finance, I don't know if I should get into the, the problem becomes with mark to market, right? So the holder and the issuer of the, of this derivative contract, CDS, has to, you know, either, uh, especially if, if the contract value goes up, the probability of loss increases, the contract value will increase increase the holder of the uh, CDS will ask for collateral from the issuer saying that hey listen you know mark to market they'll mark them and then you'll want some collateral for it and this I think that's where AIG was running into trouble yeah and so like hey guys like what I would do and I mean, in in a way, this is kind of fun because now I now I know how me and Manny are going to have to work together. And by the way, like we said before, this is unscripted. We don't. I mean, and I I like this because we're talking business, and me and Manny is able to make this stuff up as we go along. And that doesn't mean to say we're unprepared. It means to say that we're bringing perspective to you that we don't have to sit here and think about. Wonder I don't have to research on Google over here. We know this stuff. Okay. So that's a real good thing. Now, Manny, I would say to you, you know, we're bringing up issues with mark to market accounting. And this is one of the things that came out of the Enron debacle, if you remember that. Yep, and yep. Enron was allowed to use mark to market accounting. Now, the fact of the matter is, guys, is that one of the things you have to understand is what is the structure of this firm, right? And if I have an investment bank, that turns over its inventory. They're out making daily trades, right? Mm -hmm. The bottom line is, is that I can't use what is this, accrual-based accounting like Manny lived in, in his world of CPAism and gap accounting. Mark to market actually allows the firm to see on a trading account and stuff like that, their daily P&L, their daily valuation. And, you know, as, uh, as someone who's interested in it from another standpoint, like the government, I'd be fairly concerned if I didn't know the value of one of these big banks. And what I would have to do is at the end of the quarter, end of the year, I'd have to look at their annual reports. We can't do that, right? So mark to market accounting isn't a bad thing. Mark to market accounting is you have to understand it because there's ways to kind of get around it. And then then you have to look to see, okay, what is the process by you using mark to market to do this stuff? But that's a little bit beyond what we're talking about here. But getting back to this this fifth bullet point here is it does come in to introducing to you guys that listen, there are jobs out there that we don't know about because I'm not connecting what my PhD professor taught me in school and they can't connect to it because they never had skin in the game and they don't know this stuff. And at the end of the day, you're you're going out there and just filling out blind resumes and you're filling out stuff on USA jobs and jobscoop.com and whatever. And it's like, no, no, we have to know, we have to know our science a little bit better. And this is the perspective we're bringing to you. Okay, so anyway, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff and we've done a lot of studies of the board of directors, et cetera. We don't, we're gonna go on to the next slide. So this is corporate finance, right? So we, we, we talked already about the need for the firm to create value. So me and Manny now, Manny taught me something today, is that value doesn't have to always be monetary. Value could be social good, it could be green good, it could be stuff like that. I'm still a little bit wondering if that's really gonna be anything more than a marketing ploy, but we're gonna pretend that there's enough that wave riding here about things like green investing that it actually will be beneficial for the shareholders, right? This is a wait and see, but right now it looks like it could be, right? So then inside the firm, we have current and long-term. You have to look at the time frame as we talked about the corporation before. But Manny, in your accounting world, what does short-term mean? If I'm looking at a balance sheet, if I look at that balance sheet, short-term assets or current assets, non-current assets or long-term, is there like an accepted time from a CPA's perspective as to what how something gets classified? I would, I'll have to check on that, Pete, but 
when I'm looking at current assets on a bank's books or any company's books, I'm usually thinking about things that are easily convertible. Things that are what? Easily convertible into cash, assets that are, that would be current assets, like accounts receivables, current assets, interest receivable, things that we're gonna get in a very near term, it could be easily converted into cash. Okay, I'll go with that. And I would say to you, Manny, that, you know, I'm a 101 level accounting guy, so I apologize, is that like in my world, current asset is gonna be consumed in one year or less. It's gonna be yeah, yeah. utilized yeah, yeah. in one year or less. But Manny, you, you're absolutely right in terms of, you know, if I'm looking at a balance sheet, right? And we're getting to be, we're getting below 101 level. But if you look at that balance sheet, we should be thinking about the liquidity that's in that asset base, right? So cash is cash. That's the most liquid asset. I can take that out and spend it, right? But then, Manny, you made a comment about accounts receivable. And I swear to God, I was going for a walk this morning thinking in my head about accounts receivable. And you remember what I was thinking about, Manny? Manny can't read my mind. But, but yeah, he can, actually. actually. I owe you money? Me and Manny, he was able to read my mind. When we worked together in the office for about a year, he would come in and he'd read, he'd read my mind and he'd say, you know, let's go out to the street and listen to the guy playing saxophone beside the coffee machine and write the coffee cart and enjoy the sun. And I'd say to Manny, you Manny, you're right. Okay, let's go hit a saxophone guy, you know, on the street. Okay, so where did that go, Manny? What we're doing is we're talking about the convertibility into cash, right, of that current asset. This is very important in the financial world, right? But it's also very important, I think, in the corporate world. So what I was doing on my walk this morning is I was thinking about, you know, when was the last time I took an account receivable and I said, here's my account receivable, I'm going to place that right underneath cash. And then I started thinking to myself, I wonder, I, I thought that there was a discipline where people sold their accounts receivable. There's a word for that. Yeah. But then what we have to do, what? Factoring. Yeah, factoring. All and, lending. <laughs> yeah, but do you do anything about when was the last time you did accounts receivable and then you took off 2% for the non-collectible amount, right? Because I know there's a wicked accounting T-transaction that says accounts receivable and then on the other side, you have your amount, you're not, it's non-collectible, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Manny, this is- if, if, if I am a treasurer in a bank right now, if this 2% discount is still applicable, I'll take my excess cash and paying that down. <laughs> This yeah, is the I mean, profit motive because on cash, I might be getting only five basis points, right? Well, somebody is giving me for that accounts receivable to carry on the balance sheet a 2% return on that. I do that every day. Yeah. So, so we're thinking about how, like in terms of in, in the financial sector, cash management is a very big discipline, right? You have like cash desk, right? How do they manage the cash position of the firm? And the one thing that we don't want to do is you want them, it's just like accounting 101 where, you know, like imagine, remember when you took that class, Manny, like back in the 1940s or whatever? 50s. 50s, okay, all right. So you took that class and they, the petty cash fund, right? You know, the 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 guy who was the, or the woman who was the, the manager of the firm had a little drawer that if you needed a donut, it was there. If you needed a newspaper, it was there, right? And that that's the petty cash fund. But here's, it, you know, that silly example still applies today because you need minimum cash balances to be maintained for uh, your expenses that you don't know is necessarily going to hurt. Hit. Yeah, excuse so, me, Pete. I, I had to laugh because I actually audit, I used to audit petty cash accounts too. That's <laughs> That's how old I am. Go ahead. No, but I mean, look at, I mean, you know, Manny, if you think about it, and it's fun because like we're talking about finance and you're talking about the rapidity, how rapid changes today. One thing that I would say to you guys as you're checking out what we're teaching is that we're not going to give you the answer for everything or anything, honestly. But what we can do is say, you know what, if you don't think you have to deal with change, that's not you 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 absolutely are are have to deal with change every single day, right? And it, it this is the reason why 
being able to think about problems creatively and thinking about how do I collect perspective on solutions is so important because sure, me sure. and Manny have not written off accounts receivable less collectible amounts since I was in, in sophomore year in college when I took accounting 101. So okay. I, I think we, one of the things that you're making a statement on this one is pretty good is you kind of showing the two type of assets balance sheet's going to carry any company is going to carry it's going to be a short-term asset and a long-term asset right and then you're asking the question now just like we have you know food bills and mortgage bills the mortgages the housing houses that we live in it's a long term and our food bills are short on the capital structure we got to figure out how you're going to finance all these things and this is basically you know, corporate finance in a nutshell. And and while you're trying to do this, you're trying to make a few more dollars on the asset side than you spend on the liability side. Yeah, me and Manny, me and Manny, and I'm making a story up, Manny, it's almost true, so just correct me. When we met in our professional careers, okay, um, we had the great opportunity to, to um, be, stationed at a firm that you know they would look at their balance sheet and they would manage their long-term assets they would fund their long-term assets with very short-term liability yeah and <laughs> the bottom line is think about yourself okay i go out and buy a car and i take out a five-year uh, loan payment right 60 months and that car has a life of five years, and I'm kind of match funding that with the liability that I owe on that car. Now, think about buying that car, and every week I have to go out to a banker. Every week I have to use my, my credit card to have a weekly kind of payment stream to pay off that car. And then you start thinking to yourself, why would someone do that? Okay, well, maybe, maybe I can access funding in the short-term markets very cheaply, and I can go ahead and I can fund those long-term assets with very short-term money. So being someone that's sitting out here watching this video, I hope that you're thinking to yourself, well, what happens if the market dries up? What happens if someone perceives me, the person that's going out every week to borrow, and my credit perspective changes, my profile, and all of a sudden the market isn't giving me the money? So, and Manny, so you know for a fact we worked at a firm just like that. So give so I'll give, I'll give put some numbers on Pete's example, right? Let's say you buy the car for five thousand dollars for five years. You could just take a five year car loan, which would be a, let's say five percent interest, or somebody else is willing to give you the five thousand dollars or one percent for one year. Right. So, but at the end, you know, so I could borrow for one year. I'm saving 4% in interest. I could borrow for one year, pay 1% interest, and hope to God when that thing matures at the end of the year, when I have to pay that 5000 back and borrow another 5000 to reap, you know. Well, now you have to pay back 4000 let's say, yeah. whatever. Yep. Yeah. But you have to borrow that money at a higher rate. Maybe the rates go up to 10%. I can get screwed. Right. So, hey guys, think about think about one of the themes that we're talking about tonight is expectations. When I play that game, there's two expectations I think is really important, Manny. The first one is I expect to be able to go out and borrow when that loan matures. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about firms that actually did this on an overnight basis, and this is very common in investment banking world, right? Where you fund a lot of your balance sheet overnight. Um, so the scoop of the day is that I have to make sure and, and think that the market's gonna be available tomorrow for me to borrow again, right? And that's just common. Now, again, we can do this and it could be a very profitable way to raise money, but I have to have that expectation that not only is the market there for me, but also that my credit profile hasn't changed and for me to go out in the market overnight, now it's going to cost a lot of money. So on the other side of the coin, I might take that car loan and I'd say, oh, I booked a car loan for five years. I'm going to go out into the funding markets. And we're now we're back to banking 101. 
I'll issue a five-year CD. Grandma comes in and buys a five-year CD, right? For the same same notional amount as the value of the car. And there you go. It's max funded, right? But if you think about it, wait a second, I have to pay grandma 2% for that CD. That's more than what I would have paid. So I, I had to go out on the, the curve longer. And then, then here's the scoop, Manny. Then you look to see about who bought the car. And I have to say this to the class or the students, is that there's there's options that a loan can have, right, Manny? Mm -hmm. A loan can have an option to prepay. Maybe that person prepays their car off in one year and the bank is stuck funding grandma's CD for five years at 2%. No yeah. one wants that, right? That's the reverse of the other risk <laughs> that I was. That's, well, that's, the, what is the risk that you're thinking about? No, I mean, it's the same thing, but on both sides, right? You could have reverse uh, risk on match funded positions, I would call them. Right. You could have a risk of either side paying off early. Exactly. And so uh, the, 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 the borrower for the car could default on that, right? Yeah. They yeah. could default or they could sell the car and the car would be prepaid off, right? Yeah. So here's, here's one of the exciting things, and this gets down to the last bullet on this slide, is that there's a whole discipline called asset liability management where we're looking at the structure of a firm and one of the big concerns that we have to have is that, okay, I'm funding this thing in a rational way, right? So, yep, yep. and I can't, I don't think that we can tell you what the right way is, but the right way is, is that you should have funding available when you need it at a cost effective price. And I know a lot of firms right now, and one firm that I know quite well is going through an exercise to figure out, is this a rational way to fund myself? So Manny, Pete Damaski has a Discover card that has a $2,000 balance on it. And every month, if I pay the $200 off, the interest is a buck 50, and mm -hmm. I'm only knocking off $50, $50 a month on the principal, right? Mm -hmm. And somewhere down the line, someone says, is this the way that I want to have this funded? It's exactly the same way in a corporation, right? It, it's just, we have to think about better ways to do things. And again, that opens up job opportunities. And this is another good point that you bring up, Pete, is, you know, fundamentally corporate finance is tied into the asset liability management, right? And it exists for any type of corporation. You could be selling widgets, you know, you, you could be selling, uh, well, you know, the life of the, you know, you could have short-term assets with short-lived assets, right? Um, you know, you sell milk or, you know, you're a butcher, you know, your inventory is meat <laughs> that goes off in one week. You know, you could, you could, you could finance them long term, but you probably will lose money. You could finance in short term, or you could be an auto manufacturer who has long term assets, you know. Uh, on the balance sheet and also have somewhat short-term assets of the cost that they produce. They won't sell at the same speed as some other goods that move fast, short-term inventory that moves off the shelf fast. But, you know, this is where uh, in corporate finance, you need to know your life cycle of your assets, your life cycle of your liability, and kind of you know, thread the needle. It yeah, needs. I think that, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Manny. And I mean, like, from my perspective, uh, like in Manny's a, is, you know, he's a, he's a better quant than I am actually. Okay. But like some of the quant stuff that I've worked at, okay, the, the bottom line is, is that, you know, what we have to do is we have to understand the option behind every single item that's on the balance sheet, right? The yeah. option. And, you know, this is a very important thing. And, 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 and actually, it's quite exciting. So the the last thing I'll mention on this slide is we get to the the Miller Medigliani theory, right? And Miller Medigliani, they bring out they they have what they call a seminal study in 1958, which actually challenged: should we think about how do we fund the firm? Do we fund it through debt or equity, right? 
And, you know, the example I'll bring up is that, Manny, did you pay for your house? Did you pay all cash for that house? Or did you put nothing down and go all in for a mortgage, right? Or did you do some type of mix? It's let's, let's, it's we can use that as an example. 10% equity, 90% debt. Yeah, exactly. So, so you do something like that, and that made sense, right? It, it allowed Manny to get a mortgage on his house that was in his budget for the term that he wanted, and 10% on his house. He's royalty, so 10% on his house, so he only put a million dollars on that, that it, house, right? It gives you leverage, pretty much. That gives you leverage of the yep. equity that you're putting in. Exactly. And I'll tell you guys, every every single point we could talk about for... I know if you're interested, right? I mean, this is the interesting point is that you have two guys that's very interested. We could talk on each point an hour at least. Okay, so let's go to here. And this is actually one of my favorite topics because again, we get into that expectation. I will invest, a company will invest in projects where the expected return is greater than the cost, right? And in this sense here, we know that you, you're being taught to live in a world of formulas. Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. Present value equals future value divided by one plus I to the end. This is the way it is. This is life. And at the end of the day, life don't work like that. So, Manny, what I did is I made a presentation the other day, and I'll tell you real quick the story. The story is, and I'll pick on Manny. Manny, since February 2020, he has boycotted all formal barbers, <laughs> right? Yes. Yes, I have. Okay, that's right. Pete Damaski, I boycotted a barber for six months. Now, I didn't let my hair grow. My wife cut my hair. I got one of those dog trimmers that suck your hair in and give you a haircut. But at about six months, you know, in the law of summertime, when COVID-19 was going down a little bit, in the neighbor in the state that I live in, I went to the barbershop. Go to the barbershop, three chairs in the barbershop. I walk in and all three barbers on a Saturday morning were standing there waiting for me. So I know the owner of the barbershop and he's the senior guy and you can't go to the junior guy when the senior guy's standing there where there's no one in the chair. So you go up to the older guy, you sit in his chair and first thing I do is start talking business. How's it going? And when we're talking about ex expectations, I'm uh, the question I have, Manny, is like if you ever went to a barber shop or a stylist or whatever, can you imagine how they think about their business and what would close that business down? They were closed for four months. The state that we live in closed down barber shops for at least four months. So their income went from cutting a hundred hairs a day, right? Whatever, some amount of money, some amount of heads to zero for four months. And these guys are barbers. It's like, I cannot imagine thinking of a scenario that would put this barber out of business for four months. Okay, crime, maybe the next door business started on fire and it damaged the barber shop. But for four months, these guys made no money. And this is where we have to think about the world of risk. And this is real life. At my dentist, I, and again, like you guys know, I always talk business, right? And have fun poking at my dentist and the barbers. But, hey, how did you go through COVID? And he said, you know what? He said his business was down at least 50% for the first six months. Now, here's a dental office, four major dentists, and a staff of 15. And they're cut from 100% capacity down to 50% capacity for four months. Now, his business came back in the third and fourth quarter pretty strong, and he told me this year the first quarter is as strong as ever. But here's the take on that. All of his PPE, all the supplies and everything he needs to keep the place clean, the price went up massively. So here's a guy that his business was down, it rebounded, but now on the expense side, it came up. And this is something that you're thinking to yourself, well, what would cause plastic gloves to increase in price two times in less than a year. A pandemic, right? But we're not thinking in a world of pandemics. So this is what we do. We have to be able to live in a world of risk because that expected return has to be risk adjusted. 
you have to think this if i know for certain something's going to happen like if you buy u.s treasury security manny you yep. know what maturity yep. you're going to get your thousand dollars back and you're going to earn two percent interest on it and you it's say that's risk-free mm -hmm. but it's not risk-free is it why see this is why i like it now manny because manny if you had to divest that u.s treasury security before it matured the value of that security goes up and down when the market rates go up or not. And we can't predict that, can we, Manny? Manny's saying, yeah, you're right, B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. There, there's, so, there's interest rate risk, although there's no credit risk. When they right. talk about U.S. Treasury uh, risk-free, they're only pretty much saying credit risk-free. So whatever interest rate risk that you're going to take is all on you. It's up to the bank. No, you're, see, you, you came back. So we're we're looking at this slide, and I mean, there's really there's no real uh huh about this, but you know what we should do is we should really think about risk reward. Yeah, and yeah. when I said before, you have to understand the incentives, understand the incentives of the corporation, understand the exec, uh, incentives of the senior managers. What are they trying to do? And you look at this word hubris, which is false pride or something like that, and yeah, yeah. you're looking at it. And I just found these two examples the other day. I. I this isn't how I would describe hubris, but I, I Googled hubris and business acumen, and it said, you know what, Ford, in the 1970s, they were so confident that the Ford Pinto, that little mini station wagon that would blow up when you hit it from behind, yeah, that yeah. the station wagon, and that Ford Country Squire, my dad actually had a station wagon with a fake piece of wood on the side. Remember that one, Manny? Yeah. Okay. And... The bottom line is, is that that was the way that we transported a family of six, man. You had room in the back and you sat in the trunk facing each other and stuff like that. And Lee Iacocca said, we, he thinks the minivan's the way to go. Ford says, no way, get out of here. And so, so he goes to Chrysler and Chrysler by far. I don't, I don't think I know if Ford even has a minivan. No, I bought, I bought one of the first Chrysler town and country minivans. Did you like it? Well, I haven't gone away from minivans, but I switched over to Honda. <laughs> yeah. And now Manny has a Honda with 200,000 miles on it, right? At least. Is that about right? Yep. Yeah. So I'll give you another example for hubris that, that really, you know, stays in my mind. I, I buy a lot of coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. Yes. And you know exactly what I'm thinking about. They thought they had the market and they were not doing anything. Here comes an upstart out of Seattle. <laughs> Just blew them away. And got every single corner. Starbucks. No, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to buy that one totally, but I, I, I know where you're coming from. They, but I'm they, not sure whether Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts is like from Massachusetts or Connecticut. They're a Northeastern based company. And I'm just thinking to myself, I don't even think they compete on the West Coast, right? I, I don't know whether they stretch to LA, but this is my, me thinking. So right what you had court, though, right in the Manny, East, right? They didn't they didn't follow up on the changing market desires, right? They did not recognize this, you know, yuppie or the influential younger kids with bucks coming in looking for style and panache and Whatever. Well, like when you go when you go to Dunkin' Donuts, do you go there for the experience of going into Dunkin' Donuts, or you go in there for quick coffee, not the door? <laughs> but they had the market; they could have broken into the other market, making no, capital. exactly, exactly. I mean, you're you're right. So, and and I don't want to date myself, but Manny remembers when Kmart used to be around. Oh, and yeah. oh yeah, Kmart was around fully until the 1990s or maybe even early 2000s. Yeah, and they were, I wouldn't say it's full of hubris, but they were the big dominant store chain in the United States until this up store, up store chain store from Benetton, Arkansas, or someplace like that, decided to start putting big mega stores in country cities, right? Yeah. In the country, in the suburban and the sub suburban communities. And if you look at Kmart, Kmart was all in the city, Kmart had smaller stores. Yep, yep. And Kmart said, yeah, this is the way it's going to go. And you can just see that that didn't work. Same thing with hubris. Like, uh, what's that big mall outside of New York City in Rutherford, New Jersey? The one, 
Like it's not the Mall of America, but it's Dream Mall or something like that. And these people will say, well, if you build it, people will come. <laughs> but then the retail model's broken now, right? So this is this is important. Okay, so anyways, real quick on the risk, you have to understand what's going on. What action is happening at the firm and why is it occurring is is super important. The last point I want to bring up here is that, you know, Manny, if I told you that if if I was investing in a firm and I I called into their investor call or read their annual report and the firm said we're in this transformational period. What does transformation mean to you? If 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 what does that mean? <laughs> well, for me whenever they are saying that there's a transformation period lately what i have seen is transforming into more uh, more investment in information technology uh, both in the hardware software in in cloud everywhere where they could gain a lot more efficiency right oh okay i mean but, uh, i mean again this is this is the beauty of our conversation man that wasn't exactly what i was thinking but, but i think that's a valid point so okay. transformation in manny's view manny if i could parrot that back and maybe be corrected is that it means that the firm is you know undertaking a change to become more efficient right transformation so we're going to instead of hiring 10 Mannies to do bookkeeping, we will buy a QuickBook product to put on our PC that can make all these accounting statements, you know, real time, and we don't have to put up with Manny calling off sick every day. And, and where right? we are seeing this, Pete, a lot is a lot of companies would be putting this thing called cost to achieve, which is cost that they're incurring. And this goes back to one of your other points of that has long, longer term benefits. Like if they buy 10 servers this year, right? Or if they move to cloud, all of those are like have a lot of upfront cost, which they have expensing, but they don't want the investor to take that into consideration because they are supposed to give you a, a lot more benefits in the back end where your total cost becomes lower. Uh, that's, that's well, I agree with that, Manny. And I mean, the, I'll take a step back when I when I think about transformation. If a firm says we're going under a transformation initiative, for me that kind of implies that what they're doing now isn't working. Yep, that okay. also is a red flag for me. Pete. You know, yeah, it's, it's a red flag, right? And and to be honest with you, uh, there's a lot of firms. You can Google transformation in corporate America, and you'll just see firms that are they, they make this announcement, and it's like you know for the investor or for the person on the street, it's like that you don't really know what transformation means, but to me, it means that okay, you know what, guys, this this particular path we're on isn't working. We got we got to do something else here. And the the last bullet point is, and then Manny did hit on this one. Manny's saying, well, one of the one of the parts of a transformation is to really focus on our costs and get those costs under control. And to be very honest with you, every firm has a bunch of metrics that talks about cost as a percentage of income, cost as a percentage of whatever it is, anything they can do to be more efficient. And that's one part of transformation. But another part of transformation, Manny, is when a firm decides, listen, this line of business or this legal entity is no longer profitable. Mm -hmm. What we'll do is we'll chop that off and maybe we'll get rid of it. Maybe we'll divest it but maybe we'll make up another name for a part of our company and dump that bad stuff, that stinky stuff into that entity and we'll hide it over there. Not necessarily hide it, but we'll just manage it under a different name and we'll call that like non-core business, right? Non-core, or you will merge it with another successful business for, for external optic purposes only. Internally, you would still be managing it as two separate entities. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, in Enron, Enron was classic with with making shell companies up and then dumping bad assets in it. 
but we're not even talking about what we see is not Enron like. It's just like, listen, we're going to cut. And the question is, can a firm cut itself to viability? So let's use very publicly GE here. So this isn't me and Manny talking about a company, right? But what they've done is GE doesn't make light bulbs anymore and they don't make your kitchen stove anymore or your refrigerator. And GE's getting out of a lot of stuff that we know GE for. And they're retrenching themselves into healthcare. They're trenching themselves into satellite and locomotives and stuff like that. And I think, Manny, that GE's even gotten out of banking yep. for the yep. most part. And so you look at this this conglomerate, which was light bulbs and refrigerators and appliances and banking and then their core stuff. And they're saying, listen, that that model, it looked good for 10 years, late 90s, early two early 2000s, right? Yep. And it's kind of like the shine wore off. So this is the kind of stuff. And what we're doing is we're looking at, does the market value that? And you'll see a lot of companies that transform themselves. And if they reduce themselves so much, they become non-viable. Mm -hmm. And Manny, I was at, I was at a firm that was the takeover of your first firm. Yeah. Okay. You're, 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 you're right. And I'm talking to a guy behind his desk and he said, listen, he says, the capital allocated to my business is getting cut and I am not going to be a top three call on anybody's call list for business. Mm -hmm. And if you're not a top three, when it comes to doing a trade, you're not viable. And I think that's a really important thing, right? For us to understand that, that companies, the, and the fact is, do, do investors value that? Do investors say, you know what, you're not the top three in this space anymore, that's okay. But you're really good in these areas here, so we want you to keep focusing on there. All right, man. Let's, let's, we got two more slides. Okay. Oh, this is good. I'm done with accounting, Manny. I, I, you know what? For me, accounting is a commodity. It, 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 it doesn't give me any value. It's like, do you, uh, let's, let's use an example. Manny, when you come up to a stop sign, do you actually read the stop sign? Yes. You do. Yeah. That has to be because you're the way that you were taught in your home country of Sri Lanka. What do you mean? Do I read the stop sign? I see the stop sign because. But do you actually stop the st stop? Do you read the sign? I don't read the sign. I recognize something and oh, I know what it means and I disregard it. Right. <laughs> Yeah, okay. By sight. Okay, I know that means stop. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So so we're talking about okay, here's the story like with accounting, right? You tell me because you're an accountant, right? I know a young man who got his accounting degree. He's 25 years old. He's not on a path for a CPA, and he's working as a junior accountant at an accounting firm five miles from where he was raised in the middle of the country. Yeah. And the quiz question is, is this guy on a good career path in that space? What could he possibly do beyond tax prep preparation? And I don't know what he could do, to be honest with you. And I think that what he learned in school, debit, cash, credit, accounts receivable. Mm -hmm. That's probably right, right, Manny? That's correct. Debit, cash, credit, accounts receivable. That's a commodity. I can have a that's when somebody a program pays. do that. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pay for that skill. Yeah. But you still need that the program to produce that number and somebody to have a basic understanding of what the accounting tells you, right? That's right. It's it's, it's so Going I, I, back to going back to my first job in banking, where I was a master trust accountant, that's a lot of title. Yeah, I was in charge of valuing four hundred one k pension fund accounts for rather either small clients. Every 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 account we had was like in the millions of dollars easily, right? And we had Exxon and Calpers and you know GM, I think, huge accounts. So at the end of the month, we'd have to value this account. 
And then we would have five people on the team that valued that account. Mm -hmm. And you needed those five people to do all the work that was going on with this particular 401k. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is today, there's programs that does that. Yep. Yes, you still need someone to analyze it and come up and say, you know what, I'm looking at these numbers and I'm pulling information out of these numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And okay, let me give you a for instance. Okay, guys, it it is April 2021. Mm -hmm. Archigos, which was classified as a family fund, but it worked like a hedge fund, couldn't make their margin calls. And I don't know whether they declared bankruptcy, but the firm is done basically, right? Mm -hmm. Is that about right, Manny? That's about right. Okay, so they're done. So firms that lent them money are now out of out of the woods, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the story. Today I'm reading the article, Manny, and the article stated that in January, Archigos produced a return that was 81% year to date in January. Here's a hedge fund that has a return of 81%. What does that mean for you? That means the old adage of risk return relationship. If somebody is giving me 81% return, he's taking a hell of a risk on the darn thing. That's exactly right. I don't know. Do you know anything about Bernie Madoff? What yes. his story was? Yes. I mean, can you, can you, can you, I know you can't do this, man, but in one minute, can you tell people what Bernie Madoff's about? His Ponzi scheme, what was the basic crux of that? That he wouldn't tell anybody he had a secret algorithm <laughs> produced that, you know, that guided his investments that he would not tell anybody. And he would not put it out in the market. He would not put it to anybody else. Uh, but he just took, you know, uh, and he just used the regular uh, Ponzi scheme and human greed. Um, uh, you know, see, see, there, here, here's where, here's where Manny gets into the emotional stuff of the whole thing. Manny, there's no, uh, human greed. We all, we all desire something. Yeah, but I mean, you live in a nice house. So, no, for Bernie Madoff, though, right? things that stuck to me was that you could not, you had to pretty, you know, you would only hear about Bernie Madoff from your friends of this, you know, great Wall Street fund manager who could double and triple your money in no time. Right. Then when you go to see him, you won't be able to see him at first. And if you're bringing in anything less than a million dollars, he doesn't even want to talk to you. Now, you start begging him to take your money. <laughs> he literally made people beg him to take their money. Yeah, I mean. And that, that, I thought that was the most beautiful thing about him. All that, right, well, that's good. <laughs> okay, I. I want to drop back and just make a comment on what risk is. Yeah. And I started off this, this little segue by talking about Archigos with their 81% return in the month of January, 2021. And so risk can be on the upside as well. Right. And when you have a risk of 81% and you can go out to a Bloomberg terminal and you can you you can get this data the returns of these things and if there's a firm up there making 81 percent, and the next highest one is in the high teens and hedge funds have an opportunity yep. to actually make some nice returns because they take they take risk and they have different funding structures etc at the end of the day to be that much ahead of the next person or the next firm even if it's for one month should raise a red flag so the this should have raised red flags to everybody who's concerned, right? In the financial sector, that wait a second. So Bernie Madoff, as I understand it, Bernie Madoff, you know, made made returns 15, 20% for X number of years in a row, right? And you can be lucky, you can be good, but when the market goes down or the tide goes down, the ships go down too, 
And you can't be doing these 20% returns when the overall market, unless you're a guru. And, but the fact is, is that, well, he was a guru at spinning tails and making sure there was different investors to fund the investors that were expecting a return, right? Until that model broke. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, so, okay, I guess where that went, Manny, and yeah. we agree on this, is that... So, I would, yeah, I would state for the accounting commentary is, if you're in corporate finance, you're going to be do, dealing more on the cash flow side of what Pete was talking about, asset liability management side, more from a cash perspective. And... Usually finance guys would take care of all your purchases and all the other stuff. They'll put them into a balance sheet and the money you make, some part they'll reserve for now, some they'll you know, accrue, some they'll defer. Same thing with expenses. Um, um, I would just say, yeah, to, to, to go along with that comment is, is that you can, like I, me and Manny are big market guys. We look to see what the market is telling us. Yeah. And a lot of the accounting functions are getting outsourced and they're getting offshored and they're getting sent to cheaper cost centers in the United States and they're getting replaced by technology. Yeah. So when you have a job like that, where it can be commoditized, A, here's accounting, a transaction comes in, I split it up into a T account and I book it someplace. Yeah. At the end of the period, I can I consolidate all those little wee tiny accounts into sub accounts and sub accounts go into bigger accounts. And finally so, I make an so, income statement and or so, a balance sheet and there we go. So I'll, give you, is, so I'll give you this example, Pete. You just brought up something really nice that I can give a nice example on it, right? Sure, thanks. So a loan officer would go, that's a business guy, goes out and finds somebody wants a loan for hundred million dollars. Now, if you're in corporate finance, you are in the asset liability management side of it, that you're gonna be looking at your return on that $100 million. You're gonna be looking at how you're gonna fund it, how long is the loan for, and you know what kind of risk you could take with that, right? And that's your part. But when, then the accountant's part would be just the, the keeping track of all those things, not on a cash flow basis, but on a gap basis, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's a more of a specialized field. And if you are in corporate finance, if you understand these three things, you are, you are the basic things, income statement, balance sheet, and statement of cash flows. If you get a good grasp of it, that's all you need. You just need a higher level, high level yeah. grasp. Of it three statements right. and you don't need anything I think, else. Yep. And I, I honestly think that, you know, the first bullet point talks about level, trend, and peer. Okay. And level is, you know, when you look at something, you're you're going to try to say to yourself, does this look about right? Whatever that number is, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize, okay, how do I see that number compared to the past trend? And how do I look at that number in terms of forecast or plan, and then I can actually use that number for something, right? And then what I can do is then I can kind of benchmark myself to a peer, which may be dangerous because again, you have to have the your proper peer group, which there isn't any definition of what an exact peer is. But the fact is, is that maybe there's a way that I can get like professional accountants in some of these businesses, they, they're able to look at legal entities or lines of business and pull out accounting benchmarks from those. And then you can compare lines of business inside the firm, right? Mm -hmm. So like if we're looking at Disney and Pixar and I want to see is Pixar value added to, to Disney, I don't, I may not look at it compared Disney versus another theme park or Disney versus another TV station. I'm going to look at Pixar versus another movie studio and benchmark that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stuff that we can do. So yeah, and then the three bullet points in the center, that's about it. I mean, that, that's Pete's accounting. And I think that uh, it, it's very solid. Now, that down at the bottom, and this, this, is, this is my personal view 
as to why I think that account accounting's become a co uh, commoditized. And at the end of the day, why don't I see people getting good, high paying jobs in accountancy, you know, in these big firms? And it, it's like, well, what you what you're taught at school in the four or five classes of accounting we all had to take is basic stuff. But when you get inside an individual firm, Manny, the different firms that we've been in, if you were to compare the balance sheets of these firms to corporate finance or even corporations and some other, you're mm -hmm. going to find out that they're very different. Yeah. And all that study that I said, the world is assets equal liabilities for some equity. How do you deal with some of the other stuff like one-off events? How do you deal with something called management accounting, which is not gap accounting, but management accounting is how the firm manages inside the firm. Mm -hmm. And hey, I'm an employee at a firm. Yes, we need to know what gap accounting is, but gap accounting is only for the formal financials. And the bottom line is we manage this firm, this line of business, this legal entity on a management accounting basis. And this is when you start getting into all the stuff that you only learn when you get inside the firm. That That's another, I was just thinking, Manny, is that maybe if I was to do it all over again, maybe I'd get my first job at one of the big four accounting firms because you would go out on your different consults, right? And you would learn the structure. First of all, they put you through an amazing training program, but then you go out and you get to see the different types of accounting that's out there, right? And, and that's very helpful. Uh, and then the last point is cash flows are king. I mean, you can't take net income to the bank, can you? <laughs> no, you can't. No, you can't. It's cash. So <laughs> it all revolves around cash. So when you're when you're thinking about, boy, look at I I I, I cracked this accounting problem and I built this beautiful income statement. You should ask your accounting professor, hey, can I take that net income to the bank and make some money off this? Can I deposit that net income? <laughs> answer that question is yet okay so then we get to our last slide sometimes you could show net income and have negative cash flow <laughs> there you go oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay go so go this ahead. is right. my personal favorite slide yeah but i don't want to what when we're coming into valuation right and Manny, I don't know whether in my career in regulation and even in my career in banking that I actually built a valuation model like this, right? Mm -hmm. But the quiz question is, is that do we think about things in terms of a present value model, right? So I'm looking at it and I say, well, let's go back to our our first start of the presentation tonight, which says, hey, investment is based upon this theme that we need expected returns to be greater than cost, mm -hmm. right? So the question that I think about is, okay, I need to know the amount and the timing of my cash flows a project's going to generate. Mm -hmm. So right now, guys, I'm going to surprise Manny with a question because Manny brought it up. And he earns this question, Manny. You got to make up an answer. So don't go, don't go stone cold on me. Right. So when a firm invests in IT and invests in going to the cloud, yeah, how do they value that project? They so they're comparing against their current cost at that moment. So th their bogey is okay. it has to beat current cost over time. So you could run uh, $500,000 a year in fixed cost if you don't change anything for, you know, having a whole bunch of manual people processing something for you for the next 10 years, then that'll be $5 million. Not taking anything into consideration, not discounting anything else there, right? But you could also, this year, invest $2 million and cut the cost down to 200,000 a year going from like the year three, four, and five, right? So if you add them both up, you'll find you're saving money and they'll look at it as a, a return. In, the, in that case, 
their present value will be lower. It'll probably come around $4 million or something like that compared to the $5 million of not doing anything. So that's, that's on the expense side. But on the income side, you can look at the same thing. The example that I gave earlier, I could buy a house, rent it out for 10 years, you know, $100,000 house, $1,000 a year rent for 10 years and expect to sell it at $2 million. But again, you know, the, so I think that that'll go into where you are making the statement. I think that's what the example that you probably is going to state the future value is a singular or a series of cash flows. I don't have to rent that place for anybody. I can just keep it for 10 years without renting it and expect to sell it at $2 million at the end of 10 years. But I have to find what the value of that is, right? And then I'm always comparing that against my risk-free rate on the other side. Yeah, there's a lot there. That that was, you know what, to be honest with you, that was a lot. Okay. And yes, yes. I would, you know, I'm I'm still going back to thinking about, okay, investing in IT infrastructure if I'm a company, right? Okay, go and ahead. let's say, for instance, that they're working with Google on a cloud project, right? Yep. And Google or Microsoft or IBM or whoever the big plays are in the Go in the in the uh, cloud space yes. is going to yep. charge this large firm fifty million dollars. Yep. Right. Yep. So the question that I have is that invest if expected returns are greater than my cost. So let's say I know my costs are 50 million, but how do I generate an idea as to the benefit of being on the cloud? And to be very honest with you now, and the people watching this video don't really know that I've asked at least two corporations explicitly about how they think about it. One corporation said they think about it like an insurance policy. What would be, when you value your insurance, Manny, how do you think about that? Like when you have your homeowner's insurance, right? So let, let, let's be honest. Manny is a regular guy. He lives in a house near a big city. Let's say his house is worth $200,000, okay? And Manny pays 1500 bucks a year in, in homeowner's insurance on that house. And you're looking at it and you're saying to yourself, okay, here's this cash outflow, 1500 bucks, And Manny only collects when his house burns down or a tree or a flood comes in and, and wrecks his house. So what? how does Manny value that? And then all of a sudden, it, this almost goes back to our value. The first question that we asked an hour and a half ago is that does green investing work? Because here you're spending it, you're spending it on things that don't really count for money. It might count for comfort that you're not gonna be broke if your house burns down, right? In, in, and in corporate settings, Manny, I'm thinking about like, let's talk about my dentist. This is real life guys. Talk about my dentist this week. He's thinking about getting a 3D x-ray machine for $80,000. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, okay, so IBM or GE's making this machine, GE probably, and 3D x-ray machine. How are you determining whether that's gonna generate a return? He said, well, he said, it's kind of insurance against development of what's going on down the street. He yeah. said, but to be honest with you, I don't know how I'm going to value that. Because I don't necessarily know whether that investment in his infrastructure is going to be widely known that his business is going to be, that he's going to get a hundred more customers in the first month because he's the only guy on the street that has this new machine. He's not, so, so you bring up a great point on this one, Pete, right? So sometimes you have to bear the cost just to keep your market share, right? Especially, yes. especially if you're an established business. If, if Ford doesn't break up his plant and put new chassis box and whatever else that they build for all their cars every 10 years, they'll still be building these big, big boats. But a new guy coming in, he could go right to the latest and greatest 
and he'll wipe, you know, he'll run you right out of the road, off the road, yeah. if you're not keeping up with him. You know, you might have some sunk cost in there, but that's a very good point. That's one of the areas. It's not always yeah. cost savings. It's also keeping up with the Joneses, I guess. Yep. You know, I'm looking at this slide, and I, I mean, I, I mean, people can get the idea. Like, like this model that we're using for present value. I look at the right side of that equation, and I'm looking at: Do I really know what my future cash flows are going to be? And unless I buy a U.S. Treasury bond, I mm -hmm. I can't really guarantee a set cash flows for an investment, right? No. So if you think about how we should be thinking about this as students or as analysts. We should be thinking about, wait a second, I really don't know what the future value, and this is a lump sum, but we all know that you can do cash flows, you can do annuities, you can do this, that, whatever. I don't know what that is. And then I look at the denominator, one plus I to the N, do I know what the interest rates are going to be? And to bring this home today, Manny, is that as of April 21st, 2021, over the weekend, there was a change in the shape of the yield curve. Because prior to, you know, going into the last two months when people were thinking everything's coming around, things are opening back up, we have a couple of vaccines rolling out in the United States and across the globe. Everybody's looking brighter, and that yield curve started started increasing with mm -hmm. expectations of the economies are going to take off and you're going to have inflationary pressure, right? Mm -hmm. Over the weekend, they came out and said that India has the largest daily number of COVID-19 patients in the pandemic. Yep. That yield curve went down like this, boom. Yep. It went down, yep, it went down. And and today they mentioned it again. The yield curve is kind of flat or inverted. And when we're looking at that one plus I, that interest rate that you're supposed to use to discount the cash flow is associated with when that cash flow comes in, I pick off that interest rate off the term structure and yep, use yep. that to discount the cash flow. And, and as soon as I do that, it's already changed. <laughs> and, yep. and and this is real life. This and, is real life that I don't know what the rates are going to be. But then you look at N. You look at N, the length of time. And I'll use an example that I love sports, Manny. And Manny and I live in the Northeast, so Manny and I both know MetLife Stadium. Have you ever been to MetLife Stadium, Manny? Yeah. I, I, For what? No, I've been to Met, Met Stadium. No. Go ahead. No, I've never been to MetLife. Yeah. Okay. So I was there for a concert. I was there for some lacrosse matches. Uh -huh. And it's a big stadium that I think has no personality. And it's just an ugly stadium, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. It's 10 years old. And I read an article after 10 years, is MetLife Stadium obsolete? And you start to think to yourself, Wait a second, that end on that investment, if that stadium costs $3 billion, mm -hmm. I need to generate some returns out of that investment. 10 years is not what the expectation was for the life of this project when I spent $3 billion for that. Mm -hmm. But yet, you look at the new stadiums and they have open air roofs. They can host the NCAA tournament in the middle of winter time. Can't do that at MetLife. You can't host the NFL draft. You can't host Beyonce doing a winter tour of concerts. You can't do anything. That's one aspect of it. Then we look at, again, you look at that future value. Who could predict that a stadium that costs $3 billion would go an entire year with no revenue? Yeah. How much money came out of MetLife Stadium? Or Lincoln Field? Or Yankee Stadium? Or... The new LA stadium, none, because there's no events. Or and if they do, now they're now they're at a 10% capacity, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just this is where uncertainty reigns. And if you're being taught in school, this is exactly what's gonna happen. You better wake up because that that it's gonna be a rude surprise when you get out in the workforce and something changes. That's all I have to say about that. What do you think? Uh, you're right. Uh you know, every one of the things except the one in there. <laughs> in Wait, the what? One is the only thing that you could, with any sort of depth, 
you know, confidence, you could say, it'll be one tomorrow. What? Like when you have one plus R, because you know, you have no, you don't know what well, the R, R, and, R and I are the same thing. Yep, yep, yeah, yep. You know, And you don't know what the N is, you know, you don't know what the F B is. So you're basically stuck with just looking at the only uh, predictable thing in there with right. any percentage is one. So the one thing that I would say to our students is that when you're interviewing, I think it's a very healthy conversation and not to say, you know what, I have no idea what I'm talking about here. But what you should do is show that you understand that the world is not deterministic. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I remember I was at one interview at a big bank. This is when I was already at a bank and I was trying to get a promotion by spinning it off into another bank. So I go into this other bank and the guy says, okay, value this option using Black Shoals. Just off the cuff, right? Mm -hmm. Now, anybody in the world quant knows that that could be a question. Who cares, right? And no one cares. But this was a question I had. And I thought I did a good job. And the fact is, the guy said, well, I don't know about this. And it was like, okay, well, wait a second. You're asking me to spit out something that has five variables, and you want me to actually be able to calculate this stuff right in front of you. No one does that. And I'm, I'm really happy that you asked me this very in-depth question because it shows you, shows me what type of manager you would be. I don't want to work here anyway. <laughs> okay, because this is this is just like this isn't the way the world works. And when you're sitting at a table across the table with someone, and they tell you like you're designing a new stadium, and and someone comes in and says this stadium is going to be good for 25 years, what you should be thinking about in your head is you should be thinking about well, me and Manny, if it was 40 degrees on a Thursday night football game and it's our two favorite teams playing each other manny on a thursday night mm -hmm. it's 40 degrees and a light drizzle and we have to get up and go to work the next morning are you going to take tickets that are free to go to your stadium and come home at one o'clock in the morning yes oh you would <laughs> but i would do it if it wasn't raining <laughs> well, see, what we're what we're trying to go after here is we're talking about humans are different, right? This isn't like the seventies or the fifties or whenever the Green Bay Packers are playing and it's like the tundra. Okay. It's like, what do you mean the tundra? I can watch this on TV and when the game's over, I can turn it off and go to bed. Or when halftime comes, I can go use my own restroom and eat a peanut butter sandwich instead of paying twenty dollars for a beer and Another 10 for a sausage sandwich, right? Yep. So this is this is our society. So it's like, okay, wait a second. So tell me how this is gonna work and this is gonna be 80,000 seat same and then you want no roof on this place and then you want it to be, let's talk about how you're gonna get to the same. Is it in a good location? That's it, Manny. There's a lot of uncertainty. All right, so Manny, right. any closing any closing commentary to get our, get our students fired up? Uh, no. Just uh, there are a few concepts that we talked about in there. Just you know, go back and you know, if I want to run through the slides again, I'll give you like go to slide two, Pete. I'll, we'll just see like ten seconds take away from each one of the slides, right? Uh, you know, we talked about goals and ownerships. You know, you gotta kind of like know how all of these things play together. And the next slide is... You want me to go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, you know, on each one of these slides, I, I could see you got some nice points in there, Pete. And they should just read and just at least understand, you know, these are some of the basics that you need to take with you when you're either you're going to take a corporate finance course in school, or you're going for an interview, or you just want to know a lot more about corporate finance, just just slide through this, you know, just look through these slides. No, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think the biggest takeaway here is the whole theme about investing. And 
corporations, they're they're obligated to create value for the shareholders, right? Yep, yep. And the valuation process comes down to expected returns are greater than cost. And you know, if I can't answer that question on uh, a corporate basis, on a legal entity basis, which is what the where the where the business is located, whatever a legal accounting um, entity, a line of business, or even down to an individual account. If I can't answer that question, how does this particular account balance sheet item create value? Then it's time to consider ditching that, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, that you know, just just focus on the headings that you have created over there, Pete, and just arm yourself with some knowledge, some working knowledge of you know what corporate governance is. I think. What's the next slide, Pete? Yeah, corporate yeah. governance. Cor I mean, the reason why I included that a little bit more is not only is it core, but it's a job opportunity. It's a whole opportunity set for people to think about, listen, this finance world isn't dead. It's just like, I have to go down a path of risk management and controls, and that might be a good pathway, right? Yep, so, you know, what is corporate finance? You know, you know just these are some of the basics of corporate finance, uh, you know, have some, Understanding of that, uh, and I think next slide you talk a little bit about what are the next yeah we're going to go here with the uh, uh, risk. I mean, you, you know, as as businesses take, they're taking some risk, and you need to understand how that um, impacts your you know financial return goals. Um, yeah, hey man, you think about like uh, you know getting back to the core of business and capitalism, and kind of capitalism allows us to take risk with the hope of earning a return, right? Yeah, yeah. And to be honest with you, I don't necessarily see that as being a bad thing because at the heart of everything is the creation of value. Yeah, and yeah. if a firm isn't creating valuable things, they're not being sold, right? Yeah, and yeah. the firm will pick up that. Wait a second, we better change. We better transform, or we're going to be out of business. So. The value added of capitalism is pretty unique and it's pretty strong. And it's actually a very good reminder for us that that there is an opportunity set out there for us. Here's Manny's favorite thing, which is accounting. But you know, I think that we should be able to focus on, you know, like listen, every day I don't have to think about what the balance sheet is or the income statement or the statement of cash flows. So that's already ingrained in our heads. Yeah. But it is then how do I look at something and just dive myself into saying this doesn't smell right? This is something that I think is a is a pot, and you just have to. You, it's almost like you have to live this, and just the understanding something needs to be explained more, right? Yep. Yep. But that only comes about through knowing a little bit about the firm and you know the peers and stuff like that. And then we wrap it up with valuations. And this is, you know, in corporate finance, I think we'll probably get into a chapter where, you know, I really reduce it down because, you know, all these super geniuses, they want to make sure that you know how to use the exponential function for continuous time, compounding yes. interest. But you know what? Nobody cares. Like you yes. can take that to the bank and sit on it because I can't remember the last time you ever figured out using the EDX function, Manny on an yes. interest rate function. It no. does happen. So I don't want to, the three or four people in this uh, who's watching a video that's offended. Sorry. Okay. Uh, but that's, I, that's we're all about fun. Oh, What's this? I need to call it a day, right? Yep, Manny has important stuff to do. Okay, right. hey guys, thanks for checking yep. in. We have to go please our other masters. <laughs> yes, okay, there's other, yes, we do have other work to do. So really quick to wrap up, Thanks for checking in. Be ready for session two. We'll figure out how we're gonna be able to access that that thing. But if you think you see some value, please come back again. And remember, never go into a battle with unarmed. Get yep, that perspective. Yep. Right, Manny? Right, absolutely. Okay, good night. Signing off, everybody. I right, take care, Peter. Bye bye. <laughs>